is weder SO2 C and its scope structure. And uh, apologize for those who know it quite well. Uh, and I was I want to to use the precise uh, understanding. Of uh, a good fundamental domain. the existence for the domain, etc., 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 but I didn't give you a precise uh, a part of this picture I, I wrote on, on, on the board at the very last few minutes of uh, my uh, first talk, I didn't explain. So now I want to do this. So uh, take SF2R and uh, Again. And consider this map. We are looking for a section of that map, right? So, uh, what is SO2R, or a way to think about it, is uh, there's a unimodular, an element here that would be thought of as unimodular basins. I'm reading the rows of the 2 by 2 matrix. In and out modular basis of R2. And the map here is just taking its Z span. The, the module expands in, inside R2. The Z module. Uh, and, and now I want a section of that. So if you give me a lattice uh, inside R2, you want to find a primitive vector. So this is lattice to a primitive search, primitive basis in it. This is what I'm trying to do. So let's draw a lattice. Uh, well, the unimodular lights, right? Uh, I don't want to draw too much, uh, but let me give you a, an algorithmic way of how to, given a lattice, choose a creative basis. What I will do is, putting my, is put my hand over here. And start rotating. Oh, okay. Maybe I should. I will start by. Uh, I will start by choosing a specific creative element. Not yet the basis, but one element. And this element will be the shortest element in the lattice. The, the shortest non-zero element in the lattice. Clearly, it is primitive, right? But there are few. Uh, in our example here, maybe. This and that, at least two, right? I, I will do it uh, by moving uh, contact log lines from the that frame. So I will choose uh, first shortest vector. Uh, let me call it x. And now I need to, to choose y. So uh, I need to look at all vectors which their determinant with x, x comma y, is one. They all sit on one line. Uh, I missed that one, but uh, they're all in that same line uh, because, well, maybe on that line there is the vector which, this, which is not this is not in my lattice which make a rectangle with my chosen vector. And every other point in that line 
give, gives a parallelogram per, of the same uh, volume, of course. And, uh, but maybe uh, I, I will choose a certain domain, I don't have a very color here, uh, take that point, this, this is the point that uh, make the rectangle with my chosen vector, and look at that length, the shortest length, and take a, an interval here of that length centered at this point. This length is that length. Okay? And my claim is that on that interval, there is a unique lattice vector. Maybe unique up to, uh, I may have these two endpoints, either a unique interior point or these two endpoints. Why? Take any uh, lattice vector here and move it by multiples of my shortest vector. And because it is shortest, I must hit that interval once. Okay? So I will not write this down, this algorithm down precisely. I, I set it up, I put some lousy pictures on the board, this thing, sorry. Uh, pick y in that interval. And here you have volume one of that rectangle. I hope that makes sense. And uh, okay, now it makes sense uh, for in order to write this in coordinate uh, to rotate the picture. Some rotation is just a compact noise, right? It's one circle uh, of noise. So I can rotate all this picture, all this lattice, such that this shortest vector will be on that way. Okay. And I can also scale. Scaling is not a big deal because I can always find how. If you are giving me a lattice which was, which was given by scaling a unimodular lattice, I can find what the scale was by the volume of the, of the fundamental domain, right? Or one over the volume of the fundamental domain. So I can always scale such that this point will not just be any point on the positive line, positive x-axis, but it will be one. Rotate and scale so that x goes to one zero. Then you don't go to S of R. Then I'm not in S of R. This is just some sort of coordinate that I'm introducing on my space. I will put on the board a picture, and then I will describe this slightly more formally. Okay? So, uh, after doing it, let's me, let me again put the claim in here. In Cartesian coordinate. Now, I'm getting myself a lattice. This is 1, 0. This is minus 1, 0. So that the shortest vector of it, after rotating and scaling, the shortest vector will be here. The next, this will be x. The next vector, the other vector y, will be where, on which domain? First of all, since x is the shortest vector, it will be outside the unit circle, y. It will be on the upper half plane, because uh, the sign of the determinant is positive. And this still didn't change by scaling. And it will be with one half zero and minus one half zero. It will be in that strip, right? Because it was chosen in that line over there. And this is So this is. Uh, the shape is the picture that many people have in mind, the shape of the fundamental domain.
domain mod rotation up to scale. This is a good picture there. Uh, and uh, again, I told you that the scaling is not an issue because I can scale down. And rotation, so where there is a way to to go around it and to encode it in the, in the picture, whenever you, you think of a point, you can always attach to it a direction. So you know, instead of thinking of a point in that domain, think of points in the unit tangent bundle of that domain and encode the rota rotation using it. So if you want to be uh, more actual about it. So this is a good, a good way to think of the domain of, uh, of SL2Z inside SL2R. And now I will say it again slightly more formally. Take, let me define H2. So I'm defining the hyperbolic plane but I don't want to do any hyperbolic geometry in this case. If you, if you do know it, sorry, you can uh, think of uh, other things. Uh, if, if you don't, then uh, sit down with me. So take all, all functions, uh, homomorphisms, from uh, z square to the abelian group C. Uh, but uh, make sure that they have positive determinant. So again, the determinant is, if you wish, is the volume of the image of the standard fundamental domain in Z2. Um, and uh, now on this page, this is not uh, an equation here. Just on that set, on that side, there is an act action of SL2Z by precomposition and an action of uh, C star, say, by uh, post composition. C star up by multiplication of C. So let's divide it. This is the rotation and scaling that I was dividing by before. Now, now I want to define it. This is H2 for me. And uh, SL2Z acts on H2. In fact, minus 1, minus 1 in SL2Z acts trivially. So this is an action. So the action of this one is absorbed into the rotation plane. This multiplication by minus one in from S of two C, multiplication by minus one from C star. Uh, this is an action, so this is an action of P S L two Z, which is S of two Z modulo. It's an modulo minus one. Geometrically, how do I act? Let me uh, not write it down, but explain. Uh, and you can think of this domain actually. So, uh, identify H2 with the upper half. by choosing a specific rotation by rotating uh, f of uh, 0, 1 or by c by sending c star sending I hope this makes sense to you uh, f 0, 1 to 1 in c 
and detecting uh, the image of Again, it's just explaining what they did uh, in the hidden picture out there. So I'm identifying that space with, uh, with the upper half plane. And using this identification, uh, how does SO2 the act? Please convince yourself that it acts by the natural formula from both these transformations. So it acts by linear transformation, but because uh, I'm always sending the first vector to, to one, I just need to divide by its own image. Right? So the Z is mapped by A, B, C, D to A, Z, plus B. So this, this is the image of the vector x. So, uh, so this is the image of the vector y, this is the image of the vector x, so we just have to divide this one by another. So I did this to you to convince this story. And, and by all this and by our discussion, with these coordinates. This picture is for the domain. For the red domain, for that group action on the upper half space. This means that this set meets every uh, every orbit and it meets once. At least in the ideal points. Somehow my discussion over there. Maybe I'm just a bit careless about the end point. But in the tail points, this is all. This is precise. OK. I leave it to you to uh, fill up details here that I'm, I'm not giving. This is all uh, very easy. But I, I want to rush up uh, to some uh, results, which are, I, I find uh, quite interesting. That one can get out of these pictures. Here, I'm using matrix notation, but I actually mean meaning cos x modulo uh, negative one. Okay, so I will not emphasize this. And uh, T, which is the matrix, the unipotent matrix one one. So this is the unipotent matrix one 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 one, and this is uh, is called the value element. And these guys do generate uh, PSN two Z. And let me give you the proof. So, uh, I, I need to show that every element of uh, PSL 2Z is given by a word in SLT. I want to use that picture, and uh, and uh, okay, and this is a good exercise now to relate it to the, the Euclid algorithm later on. I want to use the geometry here, and um, what I will do is take any elements in that fundamental domain. You give me G, given G, take an element. And uh, apply G 
energy field and try to put it back in by applying a wall or successively applying SNT in SNT. Since if you took an entire point, there is a unique, uh, obviously if I apply G and then the world, I'm getting an element that preserves that uh, entire point by the fact that this center is a fundamental domain. This means that the world is actually the inverse of G. And this means that I can generate. So what I need to convince you need to show, actually, a more geometric statement, every element of the atom of man could be put, this every element, this unknown element is the image under G of the entire point, could be put in fundamental domain by an ST wall. Okay, and so I just need to sell you now an algorithm. This is very easy. So, uh, Take any A class IB and apply. What does T do? T is actually T is Z goes to Z plus one. Or T inverse is Z goes to Z minus one. So if I, if I apply T several times to T inverse, I will always get into that three of width one. Okay? And if I'm hitting a, the part which is over the circle, I'm done. I found my wall. If not, the bad case was that my A plus IB point is over here. And when I am applying T, I'm getting myself a point in the circle. Now I need to understand what does S do. S take uh, Z, one over Z, right? It's an inversion. It takes points in the circle to points out of the circle. Moreover, so you take this point, I don't know, to that point, this is F. This is T, T, this is F. Moreover, well, in, in this picture that I'm having here, now I will apply T again, and I will be back. Right? In less luckier situation, I'm still below the, I will still get into the, the circle again. I'm not good enough. But as always, think of it, it increases the height, the, the B value, or the Y coordinate of my point. So I'm always getting a little bit better and better. So sorry for not writing it down, I just want to explain. Uh, so I'm always getting better and better, I just need to show that this algorithm actually stops. Okay? Can you think of a reason for that? The reason is that, well, I'm always M above this B line over here. If I, I am into I'm, I'm, I'm hitting always that domain again, again, again. Because this domain, I will get a contradiction because this domain is compact. And I'm covering it with these open sets. Okay? So the covering should be fine. So please, I'm leaving it to you to figure the details by, by, by compactness. This. 
algorithm which I de described as E in fact, and go stops. Okay, so again, I, I, I leave it to you because I, I want to rush up and, and uh, explain something else. I, I, I leave it to you to uh, fill up some details here, but uh, I think you get the idea. And now, uh, what I am rushing up because I, I want to do other things in, in my next talks, but I do want to give you a more precise uh, structure theory for uh, PSL2Z, not ju just that it is finally generated or generated by these two elements, but I want to give the exact structure of it. So before this, this obvious corollary, PSL2Z is generated by S, same S, and U, which I'm writing down here. Why? Because U is just S times T. So I can reconstruct uh, T as, uh, I guess, S in this. Or as you as well, observe S claw is one. And you with the computation please is of order three. U square is U inverse is one, and that means you know it U bar. And precisely. Please recall that we are working modulo the center, modulo negative one. So uh, uq will not be one actually in matrix forms. It reminds me. PSL2 is freely generated by these two elements. Take the group generated by S, this is the identity in S itself. I take the free product with the group generated by U. This is the identity U and U bar. This is the same as C2 and RFC. Generation means that you can write this group is given by, can be described by words of S, U, and U bar. Every element of gamma of P to P could be uniquely written. Uh, understanding and a few minutes to, to prove it. Uh, so, so what do, what do I know? Consider the the group F, which is indeed C two C three, and the map. X goes to uh, S, Y goes to U, Y bar, Y inverse goes to U. Okay? There is an obvious 
map just by the fact that uh, we know these relations. And uh, we know that this map is on to because we know that these two elements are SLU integers. So we do know such a map exists. And is on to. We need to show that it is injected. And we will do this by uh, something which is called a pin problem, which I want to, to do precisely. So actually, what I do want to show is that any uh, word in x, y, and y bar, which is non-trivial, is mapped to a non-trivial word, right? So let me uh, consider uh, the action of p set to z by not self mentions. on the real projective time. It is infinity, it is zero, it is one, it is minus one. And then let me understand now, what do my elements do? Uh, to, to these four, four points, say. Uh, S is equal to minus one over Z. Please uh, tell me where does zero go? Thank you. And infinity? Nice. So it preserves these two points. And it takes one, two, three. Minus one, and minus one to one. In particular, what I want to, uh, it does very precise and easy to understand dynamics on this uh, space. It takes that half space, which has space to reach a point, just a minute. Yes. Uh, uh, actually, I want the other one. It takes this point to that, that point to this. So it takes this R either to itself or to the other one. But minus one goes to one. So S takes the left part of this uh, chord to the right part. Also the right to the left. But this doesn't matter to me now. What does U do? Where is U? Uh, U is um, minus Z over 1 plus Z. Oh, minus one. Thank you. So again, I want to track these four points, and I need more F now because I can do it standing at the board. Uh, I don't need minus 1. Uh, what does it take zero? Okay, I left myself. It takes to minus one. Uh, infinity it will take to zero. So uh, it will take, now I want to look at the right part of the chord. The, the arc between zero and infinity, the right one, and goes to an arc between zero and minus one. Either this or that. But one goes to minus one half. One goes to somewhere here. So it means that it takes all this, I will not write it down, please bear it in mind, all this right hand side to that piece. In particular, it takes all this right hand side to the left hand side. If S plays ping pong and it hits from left to right, whenever it hits, whenever you always hit from right to left. 
actually to this part. This part that you have, this is it. Check it, please. Its partner will hit always to this part of the left port. Uh, uh, but uh, when they do play people, think of it as if S always hit here, U and its partner, U bar always hits bar. Right? Excellent. And now I'm in, in position to prove the injectivity of that map. Uh, I just need to show. Uh, take any word, any reduced word, or any word, uh, in, well, it depends how you want to write it down in X and Y's and uh, S, U, U bar, W. Now, convince yourself, this is very easy to do, that up to conjugation, well, maybe this word Start with U and end with U or U bar. That will be fine with me. But maybe it starts with S and end with S. Then I can conjugate by U and make it. So convince yourself. Yourself that a conjugation of W a certain. I either need to conjugate by U or by U bar, or do nothing. We start and end with elements with the T of U. this word u s u s u bar s u bar s u say apply this word to one what will happen u will hit here s will hit back u bar will hit s will hit back <laughs> Eventually, U bar hits and win. This is W of 1 will be at that region. Right? And it cannot be 1. Oh, this is uh, W prime. This is a conjugation of W. This conjugation of W doesn't act trivially. This means that W prime is not very negative. But W is a conjugate of W prime. So W is not an ideal one. So by this tennis game that is happening here, we see that uh, no word could be, no abstract word in this uh, free group over there could be mapped to trivial. No non-trivial no word could be mapped to trivial word. And this proves the danger activity. And uh, I want to put now just an exercise on the board and finish this down. Use what we did to show that SL2Z, and if you haven't seen the notation before, please ask me or Miel or your friend. Uh, SL2Z is given by this expression. And uh, prove that the commutator group of PSL2Z 
is a red to remove of the NXE. So the commutator group is a group generated by all commutators. But in our case, it will be enough to consider the commutator of S by U and of S by U bar. They will generate the commutator. It must be free. And the map from this guy over here. We don't need to think about P and T, right? We just need to, to think about this combinatorial group. And the map to this, I mean, the, the commutator group is exactly the kernel of the map here. Uh, uh, so S to Z it is uh, of index Okay, maybe that uh, that will be enough. 